Welcome back, everybody. Welcome to the MIT Category Seminar. Today we have John van der Wettering, who's going to talk about quantum physics and how we can reconstruct it from prime principles, in, per in, in particular in terms of effects. So, hey, John. Thanks. And um, uh, I will ask the people that have any questions to please write them in the chat or raise their hand or use any of the channels that we are using, so YouTube or Zoom. And uh, please, John, feel free to go. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, and, and thank you, organizers, for inviting me to give this talk. So this talk is a variation of a talk I gave at, at ACT 2019. But there is some new stuff in here, and I'm going to uh, spend a bit more time on the background and the motivation and the sort of the physical motivation of everything. So uh, in this talk, uh, as I said, I'm going to spend a bit more time on like uh, introducing all the concepts I will need. So first, I'm going to talk about like the idea of using physical principles in physics and to from deriving uh, physical laws from that. Uh, I'm going to give a, brief, a very brief history of uh, the mathematics of quantum theory and how you can reconstruct quantum theory from first principles. And then I'm going to introduce generalized probabilistic theories, which are a more modern framework um, which can be used to reconstruct quantum theory. And uh, these three points should take the first quarter of the talk and then the, the new stuff will happen, uh, which I'm going to talk about effectus theory, which is a categorical framework introduced by uh, Jacobs and, and others uh, a few years ago, and about the work I did in there to reconstruct quantum theory using principles derived from effectus theory. All right, so the main uh, question that's sort of motivating this work is why quantum theory? And what I mean by that is, why does our universe work on quantum mechanics? Why not some other set of laws? What is the reason for this? And in order to answer this question, I want to first look at a different physical theory, name, namely uh, Einstein's relativity. So to get into this, uh, a very brief history of relativity. So as many of you might well know, is that Einstein in uh, 1906, I think it was, he basically postulated two general, sorry, physical principles. Uh, he said that the speed of light should be constant and uh, physical laws should be the same for everyone, regardless of, of, of reference frame. Now, these are just um, sort of high level physical intuition that Einstein thought of, like sort of thinking as a philosopher or as, as, as I think he said it himself, as sort of like a god constructing a universe for himself, like what kind of principles would you want? Uh, and, then, and, then, and then he did some, some mathematics to these things. And he found that he could derive uh, Minkowski space-time, Lorentz transformations, and all this stuff that we know from relativity. So he started with two physical principles, and he derived the, 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 the physics that, that, that follow from that. Interestingly enough, at the time, there wasn't much evidence supporting uh, the constancy of speed of light. There was some, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's a bit of a question of Einstein if he really knew about it or really cared about it. Um, and so then it took him a further 10 years to formalize the third principle. He already had the third principle in mind, but finding the right mathematics to describe it took a long time. And that is that, that, is that gravitational and inertial acceleration are in fact equivalent. Well, these three things are really incredible because starting from basically no evidence, he just found, he just happened to find the right theory or like, as far as we know, up to in large scales, it is still the correct theory. And this is really astonishing, this is possible. Okay, so this kind of points towards why we, want, why we would want to care about physical principles. So what are the benefits? So the first benefit is it is productive. Because Einstein, he managed to find the correct theory or something very close to the correct theory without much evidence. And evidence here means physical evidence or experiments. Um, on a more foundational level, it motivates the mathematical structure of the theory. So for instance, for relativity, you can ask, why is space-time curved? And then the answer is, well, if you accept the equivalence principle, then space-time needs to be curved. So it answers these, these questions about the mathematical framework of the theory. It also points to meaningful experiments. For instance, if you say one of your principles is the speed of light is constant, well, you can test that. You can make an experiment to do it. 
Uh, it's also aesthetically pleasing, which to me is a very important reason, because it reduces the question of why, why, why relativity to the question of why do we have these principles? And then perhaps importantly for physicists um, is it helps the search for generalizations of the theory. Because if you know that this theory is not correct, then you know that one of the principles must be broken. Like you must get rid of one of the principles or modify one of the principles. And then you can find a generalization of the theory. Okay. So these are kind of the reasons that we would like to have physical principles for quantum theory, um, which we don't really. So I want to get back to quantum theory. Um, and also a very brief history of quantum mechanics. So between the years 1900 and 1925, um, quantum theory sort of arose as uh, some ad hoc explanations, um, which all used the idea of quanta, but not in any formalized manner. Just every problem had, had, its, own, had its own solution. Um, and then in 1925, um, this sort of developed further and uh, Heisenberg developed his, his, um, his uh, Heisenberg born in Jordan developed their, uh, their matrix mechanics and Schrodinger developed, developed wave mechanics. And what I sort of see as the end of this development is, 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 is from Neumann's book, uh, the, the, um, the, the Mathematische Grundlage and the Quantum Mechanic, which sort of combined these two approaches and uh, gave the first real mathematical foundational underpinning of quantum mechanics. And this is the framework we basically still use today. So this is still basically unchanged. Okay, so I wanna give a very brief rundown of what this says. Uh, I don't really expect you to fully understand this if you've never seen it before. It's more to give you an idea of the type of mathematics involved. So uh, these, uh, the mathematical postulates of quantum mechanics, and this is according to von Neumann, is that to each physical system, we must associate a complex Hilbert space. A well, complex just means complex numbers. And Hilbert space is, if you're not familiar with it, is a, is a type of vector space. It's a vector space with an inner product and some other properties, which are not important for us. And then it further says that the states of a physical system, they correspond precisely to the unit vectors in this vector space up to a global phase. Um, it furthermore says that physical observables are self-adjoint operators on this Hilbert space. And the expectation value of an operator when the system is in a given state can be calculated by taking uh, uh, the inner product uh, with these two uh, vectors. Again, I don't expect you to fully understand this is more to give you an idea of what's happening uh, in these mathematics. Uh, then it says uh, the Schrodinger equation basically that if the energy of a system is given by some observable that we call H, usually called the Hamiltonian, then the system evolves over time in this manner. And then finally, it says that if we have two separate systems, we can see them as a single system by taking the tensor product of the component Hilbert spaces. Okay, so this is a whole lot of mathematics and apparently it describes uh, our physical reality really well, but like it raises a lot of questions, right? So it raises the question, why Hilbert space? Why would we describe a physical system by Hilbert space? Why does the Hilbert space need to be complex? Why not with real numbers or a finite field or something else? Uh, why are the state unit vectors and why must they be taken up to global phase? Uh, on the observable side is even, I'd say even weirder. Like why are they linear operators on the Hilbert space? Why must they be self-adjoined? Why do we got the probabilities given by the inner product? And then the time evolution, why, why do we have this, 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 this exponentiated map here? And finally, why do we describe a comp composite system by a tensor product? Well, these are all valid questions and they've all been studied uh, a lot over the last hundred years. Uh, some questions I find are more fundamental than others and they're definitely not all independent. Like if you have some of the structures, some of the others are sort of necessary if you want to have a consistent mathematical theory. But still, there are questions that we would like to have an answer to and by finding physical principles from which they can be derived, we can hopefully uh, get such an answer or something more satisfactory at least. Yeah, as I said, like people have been asking this question for a long time now. Um, and if I want to give, if I want to give like broad, broad strokes of like um, what was happening in certain decades, it was that the early work, so when quantum theory was just new, people saw this and thought this is a bit arbitrary. Maybe the true theory is something more general and something uh, more canonical. So they try to generalize quantum mechanics. And this is where we get the idea of Caesar algebras, they, you get automotive lattices, you get Jordan algebras. These are all different approaches trying to generalize quantum mechanics. But the interesting thing is, is that this always sort of failed. Like you could generalize it, 
But as soon as you make your generalization nice enough so that you add certain properties to it, you, you come back to where you started. You get back the standard framework of quantum mechanics. So these were sort of the early reconstructions of quantum, quantum theory, you could say. Uh, I'm going to use the term reconstructions a lot. What I mean by that is a reconstruction of quantum theory is that you reconstruct the mathematical framework using physical principles. That's what I mean by that. Okay, so later work um, focuses instead of, instead of trying to generalize quantum mechanics, it tries to show why generalizations always failed. So the way you could say this is why is quantum mechanics inevitable? Um, and a lot of early work on this was focused on quantum logic, uh, which is based on, on like a particular type of lattice theory, which I'm not going to talk about. And this was sort of finished in 1995 by a very nice theorem of, 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 of Soler, it's Soleil, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, and if you're interested in this stuff, I definitely recommend looking up the Wikipedia page of that because it's a really uh, weird theorem and very surprisingly that's true. Um, anyway, uh, modern work, so the last 20 years, it takes a different approach. Um, it focuses on something called operational frameworks. And that's also what I'm going to focus on, so I'm going to explain a bit more what I about what I mean about that. Okay, so the operational viewpoint is a very physics inspired viewpoint. Uh, and it says that basically the only thing you should care about are things that are actually operational or observable, you could say. So we say a quantity or concept is op operational when it corresponds to something you can measure or do in a lab. Like in a lab is kind of my shorthand notice for like the experiments you can do. So if you're thinking about, 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 about relativity theory, these could be things like clocks, because a clock measures time and like it's a sort of physical object that does it, or a measuring rod, sorry, uh, the idea of observers of events. Um, something that is a priori not observable is entropy, uh, Shannon entropy. But you can um, make certain protocols whereby uh, the protocol itself is operational and the answer it gives you is the entropy. So you can make entropy operational. So it's not, it's not necessarily obvious if something is or isn't not operational. It might, might be that you need to take a lot of effort to actually show that something corresponds to something you can actually measure in a lab. But for instance, a statement like a physical system is modeled by a, by a, com by, by a complex robot space it's not at all obvious how that is operational. Like, that's not something you can directly measure or observe in somehow. Um, so a thing that is particularly that is operational, that will be particularly important for us, is that measurement probabilities are operational. So this corresponds to the protocol you could do in the lab, for instance, if you prepare some state, maybe a molecule or some cells or whatever. Then you apply some transformation. So transformation you think about maybe, maybe, maybe you're shining a laser to it or you're shaking the glass or whatever. Then you do a measurement. The measurement could be looking at it or destroying it in some particular manner and like picking out the pieces. Uh, then you repeat this many times and you, and, you, and, you, and you record the probability of observing a certain outcome. So this is uh, an operational procedure that gives you measurement probabilities. So measurement probabilities are operational. Okay, so um, modern reconstructions, they, they take this idea of operational and they say, okay, everything needs to be operational. And so they start with the operational framework. So if you think about, about relativity, your framework is space-time. Like you're working in sort of this four-dimensional Lorentzian manifold uh, where everything happens. So that, that's your framework here. And for quantum theory, uh, the operational framework is a, is a GPT. So I'm going to explain what that is. Um, uh, so GPT stands for Generalized Probabilistic Theory. It's sometimes also called Operational Probabilistic Theory, but I'm just going to stick to GPT. So in the GPT, we have a, a collection of types of physical systems. So we just call these A, B, C. Um, and each of these uh, systems, these physical systems, has a set of states it can be prepared in. So I'm going to write the set of states as state of A, and uh, omega is like my state. So these are the different ways in which you can prepare a system. So your system could be, say, uh, a hydrogen molecule, and uh, different states could be the different ways in, you can, in which you can prepare such a molecule. Or it could be something way more complex, like your state could be, uh, your system could be like a, 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 a laptop, and then all the states could be all the ways you could program the laptop or something, for instance. 
uh, that systems can be transformed uh, using transformations. And so they take a state of A and they output a state of B. And again, these are like things like shining a laser on a thing or uh, shaking something very vigorously or something else. Um, and then we have uh, measurements of systems. So a measurement we represent by a collection of what we call effects. Uh, so effects are kind of the different outcomes of a measurement, sort of the way you can see them. And they're given meaning by the probabilities they give to states. So if I have this measurement consisting of the effects A1 to AK, and my system is prepared in the state omega, then I denote the probability that uh, I find the measurement outcome J when I apply this measurement here. Uh, when, it's, when the system is prepared in state omega, this, this is my probability. So this is some number between zero and one. And of course, like all the different measurement outcomes, uh, they like one of them must occur. So when we sum up all these probabilities, we should get one. So this just forms a probability distribution. Okay. So this is the basic idea behind the GPT. Like we sort of very abstractly model the idea of having different physical systems, which can be prepared in some way, transformed in some way, and then measured in some way. And in the end, this results in probabilities. And those are the things we are interested in. So John, uh, we have mm -hmm. a question from David. Mm -hmm. asking, is the system the same as a set of states it can take on or that together with a set of effects? I don't know if David wants to so um, it's something I'm going to skip over a bit, but usually when working with GPTs, uh, we require something called operational equivalence. So this says that, um, for instance, if I have two different states and whatever measurement I do on these two states, I always get the same measurement probabilities. Well, if that is the case, then there is no way in which I can distinguish these two states. There's no operational way in which I can know whether I have the state one or state two. So then we say these states must be equal. So we sort of quotient out uh, yeah, things based on measurements. So in this sense, once we do this, we can indeed identify a physical system with the set of states it is. Okay, so an example would be, for example, an overall phase in the usual quantum mechanics. Yeah, so that, that, that would be modeled out by this, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions here? Or? I don't know, uh, David, did this answer the question? Or? Yes, thanks. Okay, so um, since this is a category seminar, let's, let's make this a bit more like a, like a, like a category. Um, so of course, uh, the physical systems, these are just objects in your category, if that makes sense. Now what we do now is we introduce a special empty system um, and, and, and you can think of this as a, uh, a like usually uh, we also include composite systems. So this gives you a monoidal structure and then you can think of the empty system as a monoidal unit. Um, so, one, so with the special empty system, that means we can see states just as transformations of so morphisms from this empty system to uh, a physical system. So this is creating something from nothing. Because if you think about a state preparation is I start with nothing and then I do the things in my lab and I end up with like a preparation. So I start with nothing and I get something. And then sort of dually, an effect is a transformation that goes from an object and goes to the empty system. So it's a way to destroy the system in a sense. Now, if we compose a state with an effect, we get a morphism from the empty system to the empty system. So we identify this with, 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 with probabilities. So these morphisms here, from that empty system to the empty system, they should be real numbers. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, that's the basic categorical structure. There is some more structure that's put onto a GPT in order to do useful things with them. So this is again motivated from operational standpoint. So if I have uh, two ways to prepare a, a, a system, so I have a, a way one, so I prepare a state omega one, and I have a different preparation that prepares the state omega two. Well, I could, I could decide to flip a, a biased coin, uh, which is the probability P to land up in one, the probability one minus P to land up in two. And then based on this outcome, I can decide to prepare omega one and otherwise prepare omega two. So then I get this, uh, I, I, get, I get this probabilistic combination of these two states. And we very suggestively denote the state by this convex combination of them. And this structure makes the state space into a convex set. 
Okay, so the, the state space is not just an abstract set, it's actually a complex set. And then it interacts with effects in a very natural way, which you can sort of, you can sort of think of this like, why would this be the case if you think about, okay, I have decided to prepare a probability P to state omega one or this one. So if I then apply a uh, measurement to it, well then the probability outcomes will also be a mixture of these two states that we get. So this, this condition would be that uh, the, the uh, that uh, affects a sort of a affine function on the states. Uh, and we can do a similar thing with the effects, like we can decide to do a convex combination of two measurements, um, by deciding to do one measurement or the other measurement based on some other classical mechanism. And this makes the effect space into convex set, and then also we have this uh, affine condition on the, the states. So uh, the way this is usually used in GPTs is we embed this convex set into a, a vector space and then we just work with vector spaces. So then we really just identify our systems with vector spaces and we do everything with real vector spaces. Uh, so that's kind of uh, what happens in the GPT world. Um, okay, so let me give an uh, example of like how quantum theory fits into this framework. Because uh, what I told you earlier about the mathematics quantum theory, that is really, uh, the, that's sort of like the pure picture. So it sort of um, doesn't include uh, classical uncertainty. But for the GPT framework, classical uncertainty is built into it. So we need to work with mixed quantum mechanics. So that means we represent each physical system instead of by a complex Hilbert space, we map it uh, with a, uh, by a complex matrix algebra. Um, I'm working in finite dimension, otherwise you need to have a different object here, but like for in finite dimension, we're just gonna say it's a complex matrix algebra. Then the states of the system, they are just the density operators, They're just the standard set of states in mixed quantum mechanics. So these are um, positive semi-definite matrices which have trace equal to one. So this is like a normalization condition. Um, then a measurement is a collection of effects. And effect here means it's a, a positive operator that's also below one, like it needs to be below one because all the elements have to sum up to one. And so we call these things effects. And then the probability that we get the outcome I, if we have such an effect that consists of the elements E1, E2, E3, et cetera, uh, when the state is prepared in system, when the, say, when the system is prepared in the state row, it is taken by this trace. So this is the way we calculate these probabilities. Um, yeah, and then we can also make composite systems, and this is just given by, 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 by tensor product of matrices. And finally, something I don't really want to get into, but uh, the transformations here are completely positive trace non-increasing maps, which is if you, yeah, if you think about what the transformations should do, well, the transformations, they, they should map states to states, so density operators to density operators, and that means they must be, uh, they must be trace preserving. Um, and completely positive here, like that's also uh, needed if you want to preserve the tensor product of states. Um, yeah, it says he trace non-increasing. That's kind of because um, you can have a you can have multiple transformations that are also happening with certain probability, and then these different probabilities have to sum up to a trace preserving map. Um, yeah, and equivalently, instead of trace preserving maps, we can talk about unital maps or subunital maps. Then we go in the opposite direction. Uh, the difference here is that uh, if, if we're talking about trace preserving maps, we're thinking about state transformers. Uh, for physicists, this means um, the Schrodinger picture. And if we're talking about unital maps, then we're talking about effect transformers. So they're working on the effect space. And this is for physicists, this, is the, this would be the Heisenberg picture. Um, and this is the reason that we're gonna see a couple of opposite categories later. Like some categories you need to take the opposite in order to get the right notion. Okay, so GPTs then give you a recipe for how to reconstruct quantum theory. Namely, you start with the GPT framework, which is a very general framework that can, can describe many types of different physical uh, things. Then we assume some nice physical principles on it that we can hopefully state in an operational manner, and that are like not too many of them and hopefully have a good interpretation. Then we do some math and we start to derive some stuff. And hopefully in the end, we have shown that uh, the only GPTs that satisfy these nice physical principles are quantum theory or something that's very close to quantum theory. Okay, so that's a general recipe for how these modern reconstructions work. 
Yeah, and that's profit. That, that's what you want. So the underlying claim here is that GPTs can represent any physical theory. So because this claim, that if this claim is true, then all the content of like our assumptions is really captured by these physical principles. And I mean, that, that there's a strong case because the, the GPT is very weak structure. Like it only really talks about probabilities. And if you, if you end up measuring something that like in the end, you will get probabilities out of it. So it kind of makes sense to assume this. But still, we're here in a category theory seminar. So like all the structure of convex structure and real numbers and such, like that doesn't seem very natural. So we can see if we cannot maybe do it out. Uh, yeah, so because GPTs, they assume the given, they assume given the classical probabilistic framework, they assume given the probabilities are modeled by real numbers. Um, and yeah, you can wonder like, can't we also not assume that and derive it somehow or like put it in later maybe. So that's what I'm, going to do in this talk. This is a, I'm going to give a reconstruction that um, um, at least for a long time doesn't need to assume any of these things. Okay, so we need to replace um, the GPT framework by something more general. And what I'm going to replace it with is called an effectus. Now, effectus theory is um, introduced a couple of years ago by, uh, by, by Bart Jacobs and Nijmegen together with uh, uh, many of his students who then worked there. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about what, what, what an effectus really is, but uh, intuitively what you, you can see an effectus as a generalized, generalized probabilistic theory, where you replace the real numbers by something called effect monoids. And as a result, convex spaces are replaced by something called effect algebras. And these are more abstract, um, um, uh, algebraic kind of structures. Okay, so I'm just going to start with giving the definition of an effectus, and it's going to be very abstract. And I'm just going to get I'm just going to give this definition in order to show you that it has a simple definition. I don't really understand you uh, expect you to, under, to understand how this is useful immediately. So an effectus is a category which has finite coproduct and a final object i. So again, this final object i is supposed to be interpreted as the empty system. And these coproducts are supposed to be interpreted as taking a classical disjunction of two physical systems. So if I take, if I have a coproduct A plus B, this means I have the system A or I have the system B. Um, so it has, it satisfies two conditions. The first condition is that the following two diagrams are pullbacks for all objects X and Y. And the second condition is that we have these two maps, uh, V and W, uh, that are given by certain certain uh, sort of uh, natural structures, and they must be uh, jointly monic. So that means that if, if they agree, uh, if you apply them on two maps F and G, and they agree on both uh, V and W, then the maps must be equal. Okay, so this is a very minimal definition. Uh, felt very abstract, and it's not immediately uh, immediately clear why this is useful. So I'm going to introduce a slightly different definition later that will be hopefully more clear what you can do with it. But I want you to keep in mind that in the background, this is what an effect this really is. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, there is a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, Raymond is asking, what is the square bracket here? Sorry, what? What is the square bracket? What does it denote? Uh, that's uh, the co-product uh, structure. Um, the, the universal property maps given by the co-product. And the kappas are the, 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 the co-projections. Okay, so does that answer the question? I can write in the chat. Okay. Okay, so examples are plentiful because it's a very minimal structure. So the category of sets is a uh, is an effectus, um, where the trivial object i is um, is just uh, the single uh, it's just, it's just a singleton. Uh, more generally, any topos is an effectus. Um, I know nothing about toposes, so please don't ask me anything about it. Um, but I'm told that toposes are effectuses in sort of a boring way. So there there's something called there's something what's called a Boolean effectus, and they're very classical. 
which I guess if you see topo topoi as sort of uh, models for classical logic, it kind of makes sense. Um, again, I hope I'm not offending anyone by saying that about toposes, but anyway. Um, another example of an effectus is the Kleistly category of, 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 of distribution monads. And the interpretation of this is that this is exactly classical probability theory. So every system is just a, um, yeah, just have like, um, it just has some elements and you have a sort of a, pro a probabilistic combination of the elements and your transformations can all mix these elements together and stuff. So this is kind of classical probability theory. Um, sort of general construction to get a effectus is to start with a category which has byproducts. Uh, it must have suitable discard maps. It's kind of hard to explain what a discard map is if you have never seen it before, but um, you can kind of think of it as like trace maps or partial trace maps. Uh, if, you're familiar, if you're familiar with categorical quantum mechanics, like they're heavily used in, in that setting. Um, and then what we do is uh, we only, uh, we, we throw away all the morphisms except the ones that are causal. So that if you discard them, then it's, uh, it's, it's as if the morphism never happened. So if you discard a, a morphism F, that's equal to just discarding. Um, another example of an effect is, is um, the category of order unit spaces. An order unit, spaces, an order unit space is a real vector space, which has an order on it. Uh, so it's, it's a partial order. Um, and this partial order is compatible with the vector space in sort of the natural way that you would expect. Um, and we need to take the opposite of this category. And the reason for that is because um, effectuses are again in sort of the state transformer model and order unit spaces are in the effect transformer model. So they're working in the opposite direction. Um, the, the takeaway from this is, is that in particular, any causal general probabilistic theory is an example of an effectus. So effectuses are in fact generalizations of this. Um, what's interesting is that uh, the category of von Neumann algebras, so von Neumann algebras are a uh, infinite dimensional type of complex algebra that are a model of quantum mechanics. So they're also a way to talk about quantum mechanics in sort of a slightly more general way. And again, I'm not telling you what the morphisms here are, but uh, we need to take the opposite category again. And this also gives you an effectus. So this is kind of our effectus of quantum mechanics. Um, okay. Is there a question here? Or? Uh, yeah, there is one. Uh, is the Kleisley category of the multi-set monad an effectus? Well, I guess maybe one monad. needs to take away the empty set. I don't know. My guess is that no, it wouldn't be an effectus. And that's because um, something that will become clear in a bit is that uh, the effect spaces of an effectus they have a maximal element where you can't go above it. And in a multi-set, you can always increase your elements. So that's not something that's captured here. It's kind of like, for instance, like a byproduct category uh, that also has like a notion of addition where you can get like higher, like bigger and bigger morphisms. But we have this discard map to sort of throw away these bigger morphisms, but only left with smaller morphisms. So I don't think a multi-set mode that would give rise to an effectus. But perhaps you can... Uh, you can find suitable discard maps, and then if you take the causal subcategory, that will be an effectus, but that might just be equivalent to sets. So, thanks. Okay, so uh, some basic definitions we can make in an effectus is um, the notion of a partial map. So, if you have a, a partial map from x to y, it's just a map from x to y plus so coproduct the empty system. Um, if you're a programmer, you can think of this as the, as the maybe monad, where uh, this function f returns either an element of y or like uh, nothing, so sort of uh, not defined. Um, and then partial maps compose with sort of the Kleistly uh, composition rule here, where sort of uh, two copies of i are squashed into y and one copy of, y, of, of i. Um, we define the states very similarly to how we define them for GPT. So just as the, the morphisms from the empty system to a given system. And the effects are sort of dually. They are the ways we can throw away a system. But here we see them as partial morphisms because um, yeah, we need to sum up these effects in order to get a full measurement. So we, an effect is a partial map because we need multiple effects to actually make a measurement. 
And then the schedulers, they are just the morphisms from the empty system to 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 part of the empty system. Um, so for instance, if we if we think about the category of sets, uh, then I is just a singleton. So then the singleton goes to the two element set, and then we uh, identify the map that goes from that goes from to the first element as true, and the map that goes to the second element as false. So then these scalars are just booleans. But they can be like a very general kind of structure. Okay, so uh, the takeaway of this, and this is not at all clear if you uh, if you look at the abstract definition of the vectors, is that these states form something that is called an abstract convex set, and the effects they form they form they form an, an effect algebra. So I'm not going to tell you what an abstract convex set is because it won't be important, but I'm going I am going to give you the definition of an effect algebra pretty soon. Um, and uh, these partial maps, they preserve uh, the structure of these effect algebras and these abstract convex sets. And kind of these definition of the an effect is, so with these co-products and uh, these, these, these jointly mnemonic maps, they're sort of chosen uh, to make all this stuff work. So it's sort of like a minimal definition that gives you all the structure. Okay, so let me give you now a definition of an effect algebra, because that's kind of the heart of like what happens in an effect is. So an effect algebra, is uh, well, it's, it's just a set E. Uh, it has two delicate elements, zero and one. And it has this addition operation plus, but this addition operation is only a partial operation. So it's not always defined, um, but it is commutative and associative. So what that means is for instance, if X plus Y is defined, then also Y plus X is defined and X, X plus Y equals Y plus X. So this regular, com regular commutativity. Um, so addition is a partial operation. We also have, a, have, an, have an involution operation. And so what this involution operation does is you can see this negation. Um, and so if you see plus as sort of uh, taking the join of elements, then this says like X or not X equals one equals true. Uh, and then we have this uh, further axiom, uh, which is sort of tells you that one is the maximal element. So we can never go above one because like that's not, that's not defined. Um, so this might be a bit uh, abstract, so let me give some examples. So um, a very obvious example is the real unit interval, where x plus y is just regular addition in the real unit interval, but we only define addition when x plus y is smaller than one. And the negation is just one minus x. Okay, you can indeed check that one minus x plus x is indeed equal to one. Okay, other examples are a Boolean algebra, uh, in the Boolean algebra, the, uh, the negation operation is just negation, or the evolution operation is just negation. And addition is only defined when two elements are disjoint, um, which is like if, um, if their meet is equal to zero. And then the, the addition is just a join of two elements. Um, if you have an ordered vector space, and I pick some positive element, then I can look at the, at the interval. Um, and this is also an effect algebra. It's kind of a generalization here of the real unit interval. Um, and this in particular means that uh, the set of effects of a C star algebra is, a, is an effect algebra. And this is kind of the motivating example for an effect algebra. So a C star algebra is, again, it's a, um, it's a operator algebra that, uh, that is useful for quantum mechanics. So it's a way to model quantum systems. Okay, so two notes here. Um, it turns out that from these axioms, you can show that the addition operation is cancellative in the effect algebra. And that allows you to define a partial order on your effect algebra. Uh, namely, you can say uh, x is smaller than y if I can find some z that if I add it to x, I get y. Okay. And this gives you a partial order. And uh, zero is the minimal element in this partial order, and one is the maximal element. Um, and this makes it what is called a bounded post set. So a bounded post set is a partial order with a minimal and maximal element. The reason I'm telling you this is because it gives you a way. To see that this definition is not that arbitrary, because like you could think like, well, you could think, well, why these actions? Why not something else? Uh, and so it turns out that uh, effect algebras they are the eilenberg more algebras of a free and forgetful adjunction between the category of bounded post sets and the category and the category of automodular post sets. That's not really important what this is. It's quite a natural structure, but it turns out that these things are sort of arising from a monad. So the the axioms here are not super arbitrary at least. Okay, any questions about effect algebras so far?
Okay. So there have been some questions in the chat, but I think they've been pretty much all addressed by Bas Vestalbaum. Hmm. Yeah. In case there's more, uh, maybe we can have a bit more discussions at the end. I feel like for now we can continue. Okay. So uh, now I arrive at sort of my main definition of what I will need, because I gave you this earlier definition of an effectus, uh, but that has actually has more structure than we need. So I'm going to give you a weaker definition that's also sort of more direct, like it sort of shows you what the important structure is immediately. So I'm going to find an effect theory. So it's kind of like a weaker version of effectus. You could also call it a pre-effectus. Um, an effect theory is just a category which has a designated object i, uh, such that the home set from an, uh, any object a to i is an effect algebra, and any morphism preserves the structure. So it maps zero to zero, and it uh, preserves addition. Um, now, a thing I should note here is that um, the definition of an effectus I gave earlier is actually what is called an effectus in total form. And that's because uh, it it's externalizes total maps and you have to make partial maps by adding sort of this i object to it, so it's class decomposition. Uh, this here in effect theory, I'm sort of modeling these partial maps um, uh, in the category itself. So like all these maps now are, you should see as partial maps. Um, okay, so, yeah, so again, um, uh, an example of an effect theory would be the category of uh, sets and partial functions, for instance, um, or um, not the Kleistin monad of the, of, the, of, 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 the, of, of the distribution monad, but the Kleistin monad of the of the, of the sub-distribution monad, so where you allow non-normalized probability distributions, because uh, we're working with partial maps, basically. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, what we're gonna replace the GPT with, so it's a way weaker structure. We don't have any of this convex stuff lying around. Um, so let's introduce some additional assumptions, because like with this very basic structure, there's not much you can actually do. So in the spirit of of category theory, I'm gonna require some universal properties, some universal objects to exist for my effect theories. So a thing I call a compression. So if I have an effect, then a compression for this effect is a map that goes from this uh, system AQ to A, and it, um, it maps an effect, uh, the effect one, so the truth effect, to the same value it maps Q. So the way I interpreted this is that AQ is a subsystem of A, and AQ is kind of the largest subsystem where Q is definitely true. And then you can we can see uh, pi Q is sort of the embedding map that embeds this subsystem into it into the larger map. Um, and it has a universal property, namely it is uh, it is final with this property. So if I have any other map which has this property, then uh, I, there's a unique map to AQ that does this. Okay. Sort of dually, there is a thing I call a filter. So a filter for Q uh, goes from an object A to an object A Q. Now I have an, a, a superscript versus a subscript, which these things don't have to agree. Um, and this is uh, has this property that like um, it maps the uniprobability to below Q. Um, and the interpretation here is that A Q is the system, the subsystem of A where Q has some probability of being true. And then this filter, what it does is it, um, it maps A by sort of post-selecting where it is true. So it sort of throws away all the stuff where it isn't true. So if you were to say, have a state on A and you transport the state along this map, then you get a state where like you've sort of post-selected for Q being true. And again, this has a this has this has universal property, namely it is initial with this uh, with this with this property. So if you have some map here, if you have some map here, then we have a unique map that connects this this triangle. Um, okay, so these things, they were introduced under a different name, namely quotient and comprehension, where quotient is filter and comprehension is compression, um, and they arise as um, adjunctions. Namely, I can make this, this uh, category of predicates of my, of my effect theory. And there the objects are, instead of just objects, my objects are uh, uh, effects. 
and the morphisms preserve the effect in a certain way. And then there's, there's two canonical ways in which you can embed uh, the category uh, into this predicate category uh, via, uh, by mapping, by sending every object to like the zero effect and sending it to the one effect. And there's a forgetful function the other way and it gives you an injunction chain. And then quotient is a uh, left adjoint to zero and com comprehension is a right adjoint to, uh, to truth, to one. So this is, um, yeah, there's sort of a uh, universal construction that, 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 is sort of, that, that gives you these uh, filters and compressions. Okay, so let me give a concrete example of how these things work. Um, so I'm gonna take my category to be the category of uh, complex matrices, so complex square matrices, sort of as a model for content theory. And again, I'm gonna take the opposite because that's what's needed for it to be a proper effectus. Um, and then if I have a map, uh, so I need to have a positive map, so it, uh, it, it uh, sends a positive A to a positive element. Um, then it turns out in this category, the effects, they correspond precisely to the elements of the matrices which are above zero and below one. And for such an effect, I can take um, uh, the triangulation, the, um, uh, the decomposition into, pro into projections with some eigenvalues. Uh, so these are just uh, orthogonal projections. And then I can define uh, the ceiling of Q, which is the, uh, the smallest projection that is above Q. And I can define the floor of Q, which is the largest projection that is below Q. And we need these things to define the filter and, and compression. So with these definitions, then the projection for an effect Q is given by um, the map that um, just projects onto uh, this projection. So it just, it just, um, um, yeah, it just takes a matrix A and it just puts its projections around it. Uh, note that we're working in the opposite category, so this is going in the opposite direction from the definition of a compression I gave earlier. Um, and then a filter, it uh, multiplies with sort of these square root things. Uh, and if you know something about, about quantum theory, then this should look familiar. This is sort of the, the state update rule, that if I, um, if I have a state P and I apply an effect or measurement Q, uh, then this is the way I should update my new state. So this is again sort of seen as sort of a post-selection for having this outcome Q. Uh, and of course, uh, these projections and filters are universal objects, so they're only unique up to unique isomorphism. So uh, in this case, you can apply an isomorphism on this object here, and we can apply an isomorphism on this object here. Okay. Uh, I need one more definition, uh, which is that of an image. So the image of a map is the smallest effect, which is that if I take the, the, the negation, then it is zero. Um, and another way to think of this is if F maps one to one, so if it's a total map, then it's also the smallest effect Q so that such that it maps Q to one. So this is sort of the support of F is a way to think of it. Uh, and we call an effect Q sharp if it's the image of some map. Um, so if you think about quantity with the example I gave before, then effect Q is sharp precisely when there's a projection. Okay, so uh, a proposition to sort of relate these new notions to things that might be more familiar to other people is that an effect theory has images and for all sharp effects, compressions and filters, even only if the category has all kernels and co-kernels. So, uh, yeah, we can, if, if, if we only cared about sharp effects, then I could just say, oh, my category has all kernels and co-kernels, and then I have all the structure. Um, so in fact, compressions are precisely kernels. And if you have a filter for a sharp effect, those are also co-kernels. So a way to see a filter is as a fuzzy co-kernel, because like if you have a non-sharp effect, this is sort of like a fuzzy, fuzzy co-kernel. Okay. Um, so um, my reconstruction of quantum theory based on effectus theory, what it does is it makes assumptions on pure maps. And the, one of the subtleties there is that I have a slightly different definition of what a pure map is than, than is usual in say uh, GPT. And that's because we have different structure to work with. So a definition needs to be different. Um, so I call a map pure 
when there is a filter and there's a compression such that f is a, is a composition of such a compression of the filter in this precise order, which is kind of also a subtlety. Um, the motivation for this basically is that if I take this category of complex matrices, which is my model for, for, uh, for quantum theory, then a map is pure, if and only if I can find an isometry, uh, so not an isometry, just an arbitrary linear map, such that f is just a conjugation with these linear maps. Um, these maps are called uh, Krauss rank one operators, and they're usually seen as sort of like, they are like pure maps in quantum theory. Um, there's some discussion to be had whether only unitary maps should perhaps be called uh, pure and nothing else. But the problem then is that you only have pure maps from a system to itself, and you don't have pure maps between systems. So it's kind of too restrictive for our purposes. So we slightly generalize this notion. Um, so an important note here is that from the definition of pure I gave here, it's not clear that pure maps are closed under composition because I have this composition in a very particular order, right? I have first a compression, or sorry, first a filter and then a compression. So if I take composition of two pure maps, well, I have to sort of resolve these objects into, into a smaller thing. And it's not a priori clear that you can do this. Um, but it is true in, in for, for, for quantum mechanics. But like in general, we have to assume that this, this is actually also true. If we can compose pure maps and we, we retain a pure map. Um, another nice feature is that if we look at the quantum mechanics here, there is an obvious dagger structure on it. Namely, we just take this dagger to the other side and that's the dagger of the map. So um, the definition we're going to give now, like the axioms we're going to assume on an effect theory are sort of motivated by this stuff. Um, so some further motivation before I give those actions is that, as I said, a compression, it sort of relates uh, the subsystem where an effect is certainly true to the original system. And a filter sort of converts to that, namely it filters the subsystem to make an effect true. But sort of a corollary, this is if you think a bit about it and intuitively, if I reverse a filter, so if I do a uh, filter, uh, if I do the time reversal of filter and like, because I'm talking about dagger categories, so I want to have, I, I'm thinking of a dagger, sort of a notion of time reverse. And reversing a filter should get me something close to a compression and vice versa. Um, and also, if we, if I have a compression for, certain, for a given effect Q, so I go from the subsystem to the larger system, and then I filter for the same effect, well, then I arrive back at the same system. So, it's sort of like I haven't done anything because I first like forgotten that like my predicate is true in the subsystem and then I've gone back to the system. So it's th this composition uh, gives me an identity. So I'm going to assume these as, as, as actions for the thing and I'm going to get my main definition, which is a pure effect theory. So that's an effect theory which satisfies the following assumptions. So first of all, all maps have images. Um, and when Q is sharp, so an effect Q is sharp, then also its negation is sharp. And it's a bit unfortunate that we have to assume this and it's not uh, automatically. I actually don't know whether it's automatically given the other assumptions I'll introduce, but yeah, I haven't found any counterexamples. But uh, then all effects have filters and compressions and the pure maps, so these compositions of filters and compressions, they form a dagger category. And then finally, uh, if I have a compression, then its dagger is a filter and also vice versa. And uh, compression for sharp effects Q are isometry. So that's, oh, what did I just do? Uh, so if I first do a compression and then I do a filter, because remember this is a filter, that's just the identity. Okay, is that somewhat clear? Is there any questions at this point? There seems to be no questions so far. Okay. Uh, yeah, so examples that satisfy these, these assumptions are uh, the Kleisley category of the, of, of the distribution monad, um, the category for Neumann algebras with normal completely positive subunital maps. I know it's a whole handful, but it's like the type of maps, type of maps you would want between Neumann algebras. Uh, the category of finite dimensional uh, real C star algebras, so real here means instead of complex numbers, real, so also real. Um, and the example that's most interesting for, for me, so the most general in a sense, is the category of Euclidean Jordan algebras. I'm gonna explain what those are in a minute. 
Okay. So, uh, yeah, because uh, Euclidean drawn algebras, they're a, um, they're a generalization of, of, of quantum systems that were introduced in the 1930s as sort of this attempt to generalize quantum theory. Um, and it turned out that actually these attempts sort of failed because they're very close to quantum mechanics. And many things you can do in quantum, quantum theory and operator algebra, you can also do for Jordan algebra. So the definition is just that a Euclidean Jordan algebra is a real Hilbert space, which has a commutative unital product. And it satisfies these two additional assumptions. This is called the Jordan identity, and it's a weak type of, of uh, associativity. And this is just saying that the product is symmetric with respect to the inner product. So this is quite quite of an arbitrary definition, uh, and yeah, it's it's not immediately obvious why you should care about this. But examples are if I take the self joint matrices over the real numbers, complex numbers, or quaternions, for instance, where the Jordan product is um, is sort of uh, anti commutator of the two of the of matrix products, and the inner product is just a trace. So. Uh, Usually a Jordan algebra is kind of hard to explain like why people should care about this. Uh, it's, it's kind of a weird structure. Um, but yeah, as I said, like they're a very useful generation for, for quantum mechanics and many things you can prove in operator algebras like C-star algebras or Neumann algebras, you can also prove in Jordan algebras. And uh, many reconstructions of quantum theory, they get Jordan algebras as a sort of intermediate stop. So like they first derive the structure of a Jordan algebra and then they derive the full structure of quantum mechanics. Okay, so uh, I'm almost to the point where I can state my, my, my big theorem. Um, but unfortunately, as I, I'm sort of gonna pull a bait and switch on you and is that um, we've done everything so far without using real numbers, but for the actual reconstruction result, I do need to have the structure around. So I'm gonna say an effect theory is called operational when the scalars are just the real numbers, so the scalars are just the regular probabilities, um, and your states, they order separate the effects. So that means that um, um, if applying, uh, if I have two effects A and B, and the probability that A is true is smaller than the probability that B is true for every state that can apply to it, then A is smaller than B, that's basically order separation. And sort of this condition that's usually assumed implicitly in for GPTs. Um, and then sort of, sort of helpful conditions is that the effect spaces are finite dimensional and the set of states, well, because now we're working with vector spaces, the, sets, the set must be a closed subspace. Well, not a closed subspace, but a closed set. Um, and this is sort of a coherence condition that like, if I have a system where the effects are trivial, then it must be equal to the empty system. Um, and so you can sort of show that these operational effect theories, they kind of correspond to generalized probabilistic theories. Okay, so then the main theorem is that if I have a uh, pure effect theory, which happens to be operational, then there is a functor from this category to uh, Euclidean Jordan algebras that sort of preserves the effects. So that means that the uh, effects in this, uh, in this path, they are just the effects of a Jordan algebra. And then um, if I have this assumption that the effects uh, separate the maps, um, so that means that two transformations are equal when they're equal in all effects, which again is a very natural assumption, then this functor is faithful. So that means that we are actually working with Jordan Rose Press. Okay. Uh, so operational paths consist of UK and Jordan algebras. But Jordan algebras are not yet quantum theory. So how do we get to quantum theory? And the answer turns out to be that Jordan algebras don't have a very nice monoidal structure. They don't have any good tensor products. So what we're going to do is we're just going to, in, we're just going to add a tensor product to our effect theory. So we're just going to say an effect theory is monoidal um, when it is monoidal and the trivial object is in fact a monoidal unit and the tensor preserves addition. And then uh, for a pure effect theory, we require one additional assumption, namely that uh, the subcategory of pure maps is also closed under the, on the, under the tensor product. And then we get a sort of stronger theorem, which is that um, there is a functor from the pet into this category D, and this category D is either the category of just regular complex C-star algebras or of real C-star algebras. Um, and if I have this further assumption that the effects separate the maps, then this functor is faithful and the C-star algebras must be complex. So then we have derived complex C-star algebras and that is just quantum theory. So that's kind of the way we get to, we get to regular quantum theory. So 
recall that these were all the assumptions that we actually needed beyond sort of the framework assumptions. So the framework assumptions would be, we have a monoidal product, we have these effect algebras, we have the real numbers. Um, and, uh, and we have these, then we have these actual assumptions on like the, 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 the pure maps and that it's a dagger category and this sort of other assumption on the dagger category. Okay. Um, yeah, so this was kind of the result of the paper that I was asked to present. Um, and I see that we're almost near an hour. I have prepared some additional material, but um, maybe this is a good time to have questions and then I can continue afterwards with some uh, additional material that's sort of relevant to this stuff, if uh, the chair agrees. Yeah, sounds good. So, yes, are there any questions? So there has been quite some discussion in the chat. So I don't know if there are still some open uh, open question, open points of discussion. Let me unmute everybody. So that doesn't mean that you have to speak, but now everybody's allowed to speak. No, thank you. My, my question was answered. Thank you. So in the meantime, I have a question. So, uh, is there any any precise link between effectuses and uh, what Cho and Jacobs call the copy delete categories and other people, including myself? Kind Sorry, of, can you repeat that? So, what kind of category? Cho and Jacobs have come mm -hmm. up uh, have defined these so-called copy delete categories, uh, also known as Markov categories, and there are some things that make me. Like in your talk, that makes me think of this. So, is there uh, are one especially case of the others? Or um, I've never looked at their work actually on on that. Um, Boss and Bram, do you perhaps know more about this? If so, uh, speak up. No, I don't know uh, the definition of a copy and delete category. Hmm. No, so uh, I'm sorry, I can't help you there. <laughs> that doesn't matter. I read the paper. I'm pretty sure the answer is probably somewhere there. But thanks. Okay, does anybody else have a question? Seems no. Okay. Okay, so I think, yes, so uh, you can go on. Okay. Okay, so, um, so as I said, like what I just covered was the material of the, of the, talk, of the, the paper. But uh, since then, um, uh, I've done some more stuff. And this is uh, joint work with uh, with Boss Westerbaum, Bram Westerbaum, and uh, Kenta Cho. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk a bit more about that. So the idea is, um, can we get rid of this, this operational assumptions? This like that we require the existence of real numbers. And the answer is, yes, we we can in fact do that. And um, the way we do that is by um, not just working with effect algebras, but with something a bit stronger. So recall that the real unit interval. This is an effect algebra, and it is an effect algebra with its regular addition. But if you just think about this addition, it's not just that you have finite sums, you also have some countable sums. Namely, um, that a countable sum exists when every finite sum uh, is below one. So if every finite sum lands in the real unit, unit, real unit interval, then this countable sum also lands in this real unit interval. Okay, so we can uh, make this and uh, sort of translate this into a abstract definition for an effect algebra. And we call this a sigma effect algebra. And so informally, this is an effect algebra where a, a sum of a countable set exists when it exists for every finite subset. And you can make this formal, of course, but uh, yeah, this is sort of the intuitive content, the definition. Um, and then we can also define a sigma effect theory to be an effect theory where every set of effects is in fact a sigma effect algebra. So now we have these countable sums lying around instead of just uh, finite sums. Um, and you can also do this for the stronger, for, for an effectus, so instead of an effect theory, uh, then you get a sigma effectus and there instead of just having finite coproducts, you also require countable coproducts. Okay, uh, so examples are again, uh, Euclidean drawn algebras, uh, but also von Neumann algebras. Um, so this also still works in, fun in infinite dimension. Okay, so it turns out that in a sigma effect theory, the, the scalars, so the home set from the trivial object to the trivial object, 
you form something what's called a sigma effect monoid. So um, an effect monoid is a monoid in the category of effect algebras. And what this means concretely is that, um, is that, in, that next to the addition operation from the effect algebra, you also have a multiplication operation that acts uh, distributively over addition. And so what, we, what we've proven uh, is that if you have a sigma effect monoid, then this always embeds into a direct sum of two effect, mo of two effect monoids, where the first one is just a Boolean algebra, and the second one is just this uh, space of continuous functions from a topological, uh, from, from, a, from, from a compact Hausdorff space, or in fact, uh, a basically disconnected space, which is stronger, uh, to the real numbers. And this can be sort of seen as a topological product of the real numbers. And this is, uh, yeah, so the, the way I interpret this is that we have a sharp part. So it's M1 is the sharp part, which consists of a Boolean algebra. And then we have the convex probabilistic part, this M2. Um, it's not at all straightforward that this should be the case. It's, uh, it takes quite a bit of effort to show this, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a useful result. For instance, an immediate, cor an immediate cor corollary we have of this is that the scalars in a sigma effect theory must be commutative. Because this M1, this M2, these are always commutative. So it, this effect monoid always embeds into a commutative effect monoid, so it must be commutative to start with. Okay. Um, okay, so that's already nice, but we can do a bit more. Uh, namely, if I take a sigma effect theory and I denote the scalars by M, then the following things are equivalent. So uh, that states can be normalized. So what I mean by that is that if I have a non-normalized state, so a state that um, doesn't map one to one, so it doesn't, uh, yeah, it doesn't happen with probability one, then I can find a normalized state that's sort of uh, equal to it. So it, it can just scale the state up. Um, and this is equivalent to these other, other notions. Um, so that the non-zero scalars are, are epimorphisms, that you, have, that you have a division operation on your, uh, on your scalars, a sort of partial division operation, uh, that you have no zero divisors, that uh, it's irreducible as an algebraic object. Um, and it, what's even more uh, nice is that all these things are only the case if M is of a very particular form, namely M must be one of these three things. So either just zero, or the Booleans, or the real unit interval. So that's really powerful, because that means that if you have a sigma effect theory with normalization, then they essentially come in three types. Namely, either the scalars are just zero, and this is a trivial case. This means that the category is uh, equivalent to a single object category with a single morphism. So this is not, interest not interesting at all. Then the second case is that uh, the category is deterministic. So it means the, the only probabilities we have are zero and one. So if we apply an effect to a state, this can only be either zero, so just not true with certainty, or true with certainty. So this is a deterministic category. It's also not super interesting. And then the final case is that it's probabilistic. This is the case we've been dealing with uh, from the start. This is basically a GPT. Okay, so this means that any non-boring sigma effect theory renormalization is basically GPT. So we've sort of come full circle and started with an abstract definition and by just adding more and more stuff, we've gotten the real numbers for free. Okay, so uh, what, what I showed in this talk is, um, yeah, I gave you a definition of pure map motivated through effectors theory. Then I assumed some properties of what this purity should, should, should satisfy. And then if we have these additional operational conditions, uh, then we have Jordan algebras. And then adding tensor products gives you C-star algebras, which means that you have the Alton theory. Um, and then finally, uh, we show that like assuming the existence of real numbers is sort of optional if you uh, require existence of countable sums and this property of normalization. Okay, so uh, there's some future work, namely uh, minimality of the conditions. Um, so some of the axioms I assumed in a, in a pure effect theory in the FET, it's not at all clear if they're all necessary. Uh, so yeah, it would be nice to either find counterexamples that show that they are necessary or get rid of them. Um, yeah, uh, another thing would be like if we if we work with sigma with sigma uh, effect theories or just effect theories, but we don't assume normalization. Like, how much can we still do? Like, how much work can we still do without just forcing the thing to be just real probabilities? Um, 
So, uh, for instance, a thing that could be done here is that instead of having a scalars be a single copy of the real numbers, we can make it be uh, a copy that uh, is that, uh, sort of a topological space that like maps into the probabilities, and that is sort of like a spatial kind of kind of probabilistic theory. So, where your probabilities are allowed to vary over a space. So, we're like the probability that a state is true at a certain point can be different than from another point. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the, correct, the, the reconstruction I gave you is a reconstruction of finite dimensional quantum theory. So it would be good to have infinite dimensional quantum theory. Um, I have a characterization of this, but it has a lot of assumptions. Uh, and yeah, it would be nice to sort of uh, cut down on those assumptions. Um, so yeah. Okay, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, here's a, here are some advertisements. Uh, first of all, if you want the slides, you can find them, you can find them on my website. Uh, this is an advertisement for, for compositionality. I had a very good experience with this journal and I highly recommend sending your best papers to it. Um, if you want to hear me talk some more about reconstruction of quantum theory and get into the more of the nitty gritty of like uh, previous work that has been done in this area, I have a uh, lecture series that I gave at a summer school a while back on this. Uh, and here's some further reading if you want to know more. Um, uh, Kent at your PhD thesis is, I think, the best source if you want to learn more about effectuses right now. Um, yeah, it's basically his entire thesis devoted to uh, developing the theory of effectuses. And then there, these last two papers are the papers uh, that I talked about at the, at the end for like getting rid of, of the real probabilities. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. I feel like many of us, when uh, first confronted with quantum physics, ask this question like, but why? And uh, it's nice to see that there are, there are very nice uh, approaches to answering these questions. And of course, for us, it's also nice to see that category theory can help. Very nice. Okay, so we have a question from YouTube first says, first of all, thank you for the great talk. Have you considered the category theory of the law? Uh, can maybe the this person clarify the question on the YouTube chat? Okay, well, maybe in the meantime, does anybody else have a question or any anything they want to say? So you're all unmuted, so feel free to speak in case. So if there's no questions now, I'd like to advertise some more stuff that might be interesting to people in the seminar. So there is there are some other reconstructions of quantum theory that use category theory very heavily. Um, there is the work by, by Bob Kuke, John Selby, um, I think Carlo Maria Scandola, and maybe some other people. It's called uh, a, a Diagrammatic Reconstruction of Quantum Theory. And they use uh, the CQM approach. So they really use uh, assumptions from categorical quantum mechanics um, on like dagger categories and uh, uniqueness purification. And they also uh, reconstruct quantum theory. Although they do still use GPT like framework with real numbers and stuff. Um, there's also the work by Sean Tull. Uh, he has a very categorical approach that actually reconstructs uh, matrices over uh, sort of more general rings. So he doesn't get real numbers or complex numbers, but sort of just a particular type of ring. And he also uses like uh, assumptions of like Decker categories, um, uh, yeah, the, the CPM kind of work that Salinger did. So if you're interested in this stuff, that's, that may be something that you could look at. Because I'm definitely not, not the only person that has used category theory to reconstruct quantum theory. Very nice. Thank you. And I mean, thanks also for advertising other people's work. That's very nice. So I think Paul Taylor had uh, an open ended comment while we have no other questions. Yes. Um, yeah, I was going to say um, that the, I wanted to say the thought that um, struck me when I saw. Um, the title and abstract, um, and in particular the word effect, which has a certain meaning in theoretical computer science. And since Bart Jacobs is involved in this, he would know very well what this word means um, in theoretical computer science. It's a pity. It's a pity he's not attending this seminar. Um, 
so my thought was this that that um quantum it's difficult to understand quantum mechanics um partly because it's a completely different kind of mathematics from um newton and einstein and maxwell and so on um and i'm thinking there's an analogous situation that that um uh, programming with, um, you know, input, output, and, and other things that actually happen is a different kind of um, mathematics from functional programming. Um, but there's a way of relating them um, using modulmonads, um, and this is what the word effect means in, the, in theoretical computer science. Um, I'm just wondering whether there's any possibility of importing um, that sort of idea uh to uh, you know you, so we maybe we start with with quantum mechanics as being the as it were the the real thing that's going on in physics um but not the thing that humans understand um can we reconstruct classical physics from quantum mechanics um uh using some sort of ideas similar to um effects and modulmonads and things like that. I'm not sure that is terribly relevant to your talk, um, but somebody else might be able to make use of that idea. Um, and I'm sure if Bart were here, he could either tell me it was complete rubbish or else um, tell you what to do with it. So I'm not exactly, uh, I don't, not sure I'm exactly understand uh, what you mean, but I think I want to put out first is that what I call effects, so those maps from a system to the empty system, uh, they were in the effectors theory, they're usually called predicates. Um, yeah. So I use the term effect because that's the term that uh, the physicists use for the, this, kind of, uh, this type of map. I realized that in computer science, effect is more like, uh, like effectful computation, that, that means something else. Um, yes, I, I mean, I was, I was thinking, given Bart Jacobs' involvement in this, he would know the meaning of the word effect in theoretical computer science. So. I'm wondering whether there's more of a coincidence that um, uh, that, that this word has been used. Um, uh, so you know, I'd really like to put that question to him, um, and unfortunately, he's not he's not attending the seminar. So, um, but I guess you're in Nijmegen, is that right? Um, close enough. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, Bas and Bram, I think you were around when the term "effectus" was coined. Uh, do you know the reasoning behind this? Yeah, well, we considered several different things. It, I think it's, it's, it's mainly because it's close to effect algebra, which was already established. And that's why, why, why we, we settled on it. Um, by the way, I, I don't know in, about the, um, the use of effects in computer science to, to judge whether there's any uh, potential there. But um, I would like to mention that Sam Stetton, um, uh, who's now in Oxford, used to be with us as a postdoc for a few years and uh, was quite uh, involved uh, uh, discussing effective theory as well. So he would have known, I guess, as well, if, if it was possible. I think he would have, he would have figured it out. It may be a long range question. But if, was, if there's anything in that, it could take, it could take a while for it to fall into place. Okay, uh, let me just leave that one on the table and for uh, anybody to think about one. Okay, so are there any more questions or any more comment by anyone? All right, it seems that there are none, so let's thank our speaker again. Uh, thanks, John, for a very nice talk. Yeah. And, well, let's move the discussion offline in case anybody has late questions or if anybody watching the video in the future wants to ask something. You're welcome to join the Zulip thread and ask your questions there. So, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, everyone.